Hello everyone, welcome to Bread and Roses. We hope you're well. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the widespread protests in Iraq and the need internationally, as well as uh, within Iran, to support this important movement. Interview this week is with Zara Kay, founder of Faithless Hijabis. Don't go away, stay with us. Last month, there have been huge, widespread protests in Iraq for basic human rights. They've been demanding welfare, they've been demanding an end to corruption, jobs, security, and lives that are really worthy of 21st century citizens. So it's been a wonderful, immense protest. However, it's been under attack by the Iraqi government, by Islamic Republic of Iran forces and militia, Hundreds of people have been killed, many of them young people, and of course, it hasn't received the attention that it deserves. Absolutely, you'll see, this is the one of the most important incidents and events that is taking current taking place currently in Middle East after the uh, um, invasion of Iraq by the American forces. This is the first time that Ira- Iraqi society has come to this extent, come forward and very clearly indicated they want uh, equality, they don't want any segregation or separation. They very clearly said they want separation of uh, religion from the state institution. And in particular, they are against the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran and interference of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the, in uh, Iraqi society, and they could see that the, one of the main forces of reaction in Iraqi society is Islamic Republic of Iran and its influence on the government of that country. Despite this, this immense and important event, how much uh, uh, coverage and support is it getting uh, internationally? and in, in, on interna- in international media. Actually, it hasn't received the coverage it deserves. Yeah, and of course, you mentioned the slogans. I mean, some of the slogans are immense, you know, no Shiism, no Sonism, secularism. Uh, there's a, there's a, a wonderful placard which says, separation of religion from the state is preferable to separation of the sexes. Again, you know, if you look at the demands of these protests, they're modern, they're 21st century demands, and it's completely the opposite of what the Islamist movement always demands. Less rights, restrictions, death, destruction, bleakness, versus, you know, this sort of very inspiring, hopeful sort of protest uh, by, by people in Iraq, and very much against the Islamist movement. Very clearly, you know, Iraq has been uh, destroyed to a large extent by U.S. militarism. It's been divided into tribal, ethnic, religious groups. That Iraqization has uh, been uh, continued in other countries in the world. And we're also seeing it taking place in in countries in the West itself. Um, And of course, apart from that, you know, in Iraq, uh, there's this huge influence of the Islamic regime of Iran, Islamic imperialism really in that country. And so one of the targets of these protests is the regime itself. You know, uh, Khamenei is getting um, hit in his face uh, on his posters with shoes because we know how insulting that is uh, in Iraq. And of course, they've attacked some of the Iranian regime's militia groups as well as um, Iranian regime bases in that country. Absolutely, and you could see one of the features of and the characteristics of this uh, movement in Iraq is the uh, uh, popular uh, participation, self-organization, people have started to clean the streets, uh, dancing going on, and you could see that's exactly the same type of um, activity that young people will do in Iran against the Islamic regime. In Lebanon you also see everything which is Islamist brought to the Middle East you could see that it's been re- uh, reversed and people are opposing those. And it's important and everybody needs to recognize this is such an immense and inspiring activity going on uh, in Iraq and we all must support it. I mean, how mu- I don't know how much emphasis you could, we, could, we could give to this. This is it. If you, if, if, for 20 years, people have said that Iraq uh, and Middle East is uh, religious, is tribal. And we can see today, actually it is not. The young people in Iran, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, 
in Afghanistan, everywhere. They want a life completely different from what has been designed uh, by the uh, American militarism, by the Islamists and Taliban and ISIS, all of those people in Middle East want completely different. They want a life worthy of human being. Mm. I think the thing to, to really uh, stress here is that you know, the movement in Iraq, the, the movement in Iran, the movement in Lebanon, uh, Rojava, uh, which is under attack now by the Turkish state. These are our movements, the movements of people who are fighting for equality, for universal rights, for secularism, and for a different and better world. So, you know, we have to see this as our movement and support it as such. You know, the Islamists um, and the, those who are following US-led militarism, they all work together to restrict rights, to suppress, to oppress, to destroy and, and murder any protest and any dissent. We have to recognize that we are also part of a very large international movement of people who want something different. And, you know, we, we need to support that for it to thrive and survive and to change the world for the better. A different world is it's possible, but we must, we must make sure that we do not allow the Islamic regime to suppress uh, the Iraqi uh, progressive movement. That It's on the streets today and is fighting nail and tooth. Uh, people in Iran cannot be free if people of Iraq are not free. People of Iran cannot, Lebanon cannot be free if people of uh, Iraq and Iran are not free. They're all linked together. People in Rojava, people in Iran, people in Iraq, people in Lebanon, Middle East, everywhere, and internationally. We all must come together to make sure at this time the Iraqi people achieve what they want and the Islamic regime and Islamists are defeated in the Middle East. <laughs>
and I read that you removed uh, your hijab at 18. So how uh, was that period when you were you doubting? Did you not want to wear it anymore? What happened? So the moment I found out that you could be a Muslim woman and not wear a hijab, I stopped wearing my abaya. And the clothes that I was wearing, they were quite fitting and it just felt like I wasn't ready for hijab. I didn't know how to remove it and I always had it on the back of my mind. If I remove it, I'm going to wear it when I'm older, when I'm religious. And I started loosening it up and slowly I just took it off. It was interesting because my parents weren't that happy but I just moved to Australia and I had a new identity there so nobody really knew me as Zara the girl who wore hijab so that was easier but I had to wear a hijab when I traveled to the Middle East or when I visited my family because they just weren't comfortable with me not wearing a hijab so when you visited your family in Tanzania, Tanzania. okay yeah so Tanzania is not a theocratic country at all um, Muslims are not in majority, but it was the social pressure that, my, that I felt with my parents and people talking about us or about me. I was too westernized for them, so even if I wore the hijab, I wouldn't wear the abaya. But my dad's like, as long as your head's covered, um, otherwise you're naked. And just that idea was overwhelming and it was something I didn't agree with, but I was kind of pressured into wearing it. I mean, it's interesting because this idea of removing the veil is really a difficult uh, thing to do, isn't there, because of this pressure to keep it on. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not only just taking off the headscarf, it's a lot of self-love that we're not taught as girls. We're not taught to appreciate our bodies because they're meant to be hidden for our husband. We're not taught to lie. We don't even know what clothes to wear when you take it off. We don't know, you know, what do you do with your old scarf? Do you wear it again? What, what type of clothes do you start wearing? Um, there's a lot of shame that comes with it. I think it took me a good three, three years, three to four years, um, to actually even wear a dress after I removed a hijab or even like, you know, short sleeves, not even sleeveless. I was just really scared. It felt like I was naked, but it was just the idea that I was brought up with. So what do you think about, you know, uh, all these fashion houses now having hijabs and uh, promoting it and selling it? I mean, isn't it good at least for people who do want to wear it? What's your take on that? I, I think they have massively underestimated the social pressure that those have worn it. They think it's a choice. I've had so many women telling me it's a choice. But when you dig in deeper and further and ask them questions, what about it makes it a choice? And you'll see a lot of it has been tied to religion or the idea that God wants you to wear it because you're a respectable woman if you wear it. And that when compared to those who don't wear hijab, um, they feel like they have a moral high ground, which in itself is victim blaming. Because had it not been for the hijab, you wouldn't be comparing yourself with another woman who doesn't wear it. You don't start comparing yourself with somebody who wears long sleeves or short sleeves. But the hijab just puts you on a pedestal to think that you have a higher moral ground. And it's also shaming all the other women. Um, I've had so many people have said it's their choice. And it doesn't make sense because had it not been for punishments like in the, sunnah, like in the hadith and the Quran, not many would start wearing it. And you know, we still have women who are religious. Muslim women have come to me and they're, they're not ex-Muslim women and they know that I don't believe in Islam. Um, but they don't know who else to talk to because no other person is going to tell them to do what they, like, you know, do what makes them comfortable. They're just going to be coerced into wearing it even, like, even more or respectfully or pray harder. But that's not what they want. I mean, one of the things is on social media, you argue quite a lot on uh, these issues, don't you? And um, I guess you get a lot of hate as well. How, how is that? I mean, don't you think it's better not to get into these sort of discussions, some might say? Um, I think it's important to have these discussions. At the very least, it shows resilience and it's a voice for those who could never get into them. I've had so many women, Muslims or ex-Muslims, ex-Muslim women, who may or may not want to wear the hijab are like, you're brave. And I'm like, I only do it because it shows the level of hypocrisy that people have. And that, as a woman, you're only a tool for, for them to either um, objectify if you're not covered. 
And if you think you're choosing the hijab, what is the alternative? Had I not fought, had I not done this, we always, you know, we kind of take back. Those conversations are not being had. So it takes some people to open up those gates to actually have this conversation, whether it's hijab, whether it's the way we're treated in Islam as women. Um, we come from a culture that the modesty, the modesty culture is dependent only on the women. The honor culture is heavily dependent on the women from what they wear, from what they do, from who they speak to and how they speak. And it's, it's really unfair that women think that they're empowered in the religion that actually just subjugates them. So I think these conversations are definitely helpful. And hate just proves my point even further that there is no tolerance in the religion itself. Or especially when it comes to like hijab. And it's always the men fighting for women to wear it. And you know, they would be very dismissal had a woman even shown her hair. They suddenly become a whore. And that's, that's just a low standard that we've set for women in general, or even for, you know, the women in our lives. So do you think, you know, people leaving uh, Islam, it's harder for women? It's definitely harder for women. It comes at, one, a lot of hate. It comes at a lot of um, abuse. But it also, it also comes at, like, there's an overwhelming amount of support as well. Um, despite the number of attacks that we get, I mean, as compared to my male counterparts, we, like, the women are always sexually harassed. And my friends who are activists and they're male, the women in their lives are harassed online. So it feels like people who oppose us will always use women as targets. And they always identify what will actually get to women. And it always has to do with the way they look. Um, or the w or what they wear because a lot of times we, we, we don't ever talk about naked men but we always talk about naked women and we've always been the target of every other sexualization as compared to men they're just different standards set and it's just easier to attack women by harassing them sexually because what are you how are you going to defend yourself after that and, you know, I want to go back to something uh, where you wore the veil from 8 to 18, removed it, but you've become an activist quite recently. Yeah. Uh, what, why, why did it take so long and, uh, uh, you know, what, what sort of, uh, what was the process you went through basically? Yeah, so, well, from the age of 14, I was always progressive. It just... All of the tighter rules in Islam didn't make sense, so I stopped praying. And I still wore the hijab, so I think I became an atheist when I was 14, and I was culturally Muslim. I would try praying, I would try fasting, but it was boring. It, it made no sense. And at 18, when I removed the hijab, I, was still consider, I still considered myself to be a Muslim, despite not following any of it. Um, but it was at the age of 23 when I started questioning, when I met a few atheist friends and I got in touch, I got to know other atheists like yourself. And I started reading up about you guys, looked at all of your videos and I'm like, why does this make so much more sense than anything else? And when I started, I, I started telling my family that I've lost my faith. And it was always about me not eating halal food or I'm not praying hard enough and that's why the devil has possessed me or even that I'm going through a phase where I'm influenced by the West and despite like before I even left Islam I was always I was progressive but I also already had different values in the Islamic than the Islamic world but it was one of the debates that I was an audience for in Australia where um, somebody from his with the hair said that apostates should be killed and Sharia law should be applied in Australia. I wasn't in the Middle East and that was by far the most traumatic night for me where I'm like, these people exist. These people want to kill me. But other than that, they want to kill people who are my friends. How do you live with that? And that's when I decided that something had to be done. And I was the first and I'm still um, the only one from my community who has left publicly and it's a large community it's about 140,000 people 
I think just in the UK and um, Africa, let alone North America. So it's a large community. And when I left, I, I wasn't even blasphemous. I just said my reasons. This is why I left. It doesn't resonate with me. It just opened up doors for even more hate from things like change your name to you were never a Muslim. You, I, the most surprising part was that I never came from a traumatic background with my family. We were relatively liberal. So the women in my family had more, more liberty than the men. The women had studied more. The women knew how to drive. My dad doesn't know how to drive. So it was surprising for everyone. They just couldn't comprehend that it had to do with the theology. And once I came out, it just felt like there was a market that women aren't being heard. There's, there are plenty of ex-Muslim movements, and that's great. But nobody is talking about you know, the abuse that women had faced. Um, and also, I needed some validation of like what other women were going through. So I opened Faithless Hijabi, and to my surprise, I was by far the luckiest because I had never faced physical abuse. But there were girls who were raped and assaulted before leaving, after leaving, something that led them to leave. They just couldn't, you know, they just couldn't understand what God would put them through that. And people have various reasons, but as of recently, we've been talking about things that have never been spoken about, hymen checks. We have it in the West. Um, sports. A lot of girls, despite wearing hijab, not wearing hijab, being in a women's environment, were not allowed to play sports. It's just not woman-like. So all of that has built up to like me continuing to do what I do and having those difficult conversations, especially while protecting the women who do come to me. So do you have any regrets? I, I wish I had come into terms sooner with it than you know, taking a long time. But I also feel that it came at the right time when I had financial independency and um, my parents had trusted me to that level that they know that I'm not going to just make a irrational like move or any decision. So there was some validation in like my career and just where my life was at that made it very easy. Well, easier than most, I would say. I mean, I guess there isn't really no right time, is it? Because it's a very personal thing. And it's when it's right for the individual. So absolutely, yeah. But it's interesting because you've you're such a vocal activist now. So I always find it interesting to see how activists what happens in their life to make them speak out so powerfully in a way that they hadn't maybe a year before that, you know. And I guess for you it was the uh, talk show you saw with the Salafi yeah. Islamist guy. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was right in front of me, and that was scary. But then, what made it even, what made me be even more vocal was, um, Faithless Hijabi was founded about October 2018, so about six months ago or six seven months ago. And um, what made me vocal was just earlier this year, about four months ago, when the stories just kept building up and nobody was speaking about them. So at the moment, we're getting a lot of traction, be it from Western women who are now realizing that this isn't just something that happens in like the Middle East. This happens in the West. Girls have been just separate, segregated from the whole society. It's just a little bubble they've created for themselves. Forced marriages happen here. FGM happens here. And nobody talks about it. Um, we have a sect in the Shia sect, the Dawoodi Bohora, it's cultural, and they do it. And it's it's religious, religiously driven, but all of them do it with that reason. And some of them have learned to accept it. I, I don't know what woman or what mom would want to put their kids through FGM, but there were some moms that I'd spoken to who had been circumcised, and they're like, yeah, I'd definitely do it for my daughters. It's it's what the prophet wanted, and that's what act, that's what makes me want to empower these women who are only a prisoner of their own making. Thank you. <laughs> no worries, thanks.
Thank you.